Well, we're starting a new series today entitled Walking with God. God wants to walk with you and you can walk with God. How exciting is that? Come on. This is going to be a great series. This is going to be a great series. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It was the Greeks in the second century BC who, reflecting back on different civilizations and their accomplishments, compiled an impressive list that has become to known as the seven wonders of the ancient world. How many of you heard of the seven wonders of the ancient world? And on that list is the Great Pyramid in Egypt, uh, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, you got the Colossus of Rhodes, the Lighthouse of Alexandria, those type of things. And since the, that compilation, there have been other lists. There's the seven wonders of the Middle Ages. Even today, there's the seven wonders of the modern world. You got the Great Wall of China, and you have Christ the Redeemer in Rio de Janeiro. You have uh, the Roman Colosseum. You have Machu Picchu. I like to say that in Peru. Machu Picchu. Right? It sounds like something going to order the drive through The Chichen Itza, uh, the Taj Mahal in India, and uh, of course, Petra in Jordan. There's the seven wonders of the communication age. There's the seven wonders of the natural world, uh, which include the Aurora Borealis, or, or also known as the Northern Lights. How many of you got to see that a couple of weeks ago? We had to experience that. So many pictures. That was so cool, wasn't it? That was so cool. And, uh, I was, uh, but that's one of the seven wonders of the natural world. Also the harbor of Rio de Janeiro, the Grand Canyon, the Great Barrier Reef, Mount Everest, Victoria Falls, there's a volcano in Mexico I can't pronounce. <laughs> Sorry, I just can't. There's all kinds of lists of wonders. There's all kinds of lists that talk about the seven best, the seven greatest, right? Now, if all of us here, if we were to collaborate and we were to make a list of the seven wonders of the supernatural world, what do you think we would put on that list? Well, I don't know what all seven would be, but I could tell you what the first one on the list would be. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I want to talk to you today about something that is really the most important thing that we could talk about. It's a truth that has staggered the hearts and minds of theologians and believers through the ages. It's something that has absolutely overwhelmed the greatest minds in the history of salvation, of a civilization. It's the greatest wonder of them all. Are you ready? It is the truth that God loves you and me. Wonder of wonders. God loves us. God loves me. Would you say that? Would you say God loves me? Right down the count of three. One, two, three. Let's say it again. God say it again. God loves me. Come on, one more time with conviction. God loves me. Yes, God loves me. Get that down in. Awesome. And God not only says that He loves us, but God proves He loves us. God not only says, I love you, but God said, Let me show you how much I love you. And Jesus came. Willingly, the second person of the Godhead Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Jesus came and he put on humanity and he lived a righteous life, a sinless life, the life you and I could never live. And he lived without sin because only God can be without sin. So he's the only one qualified to take away our sins. And he came and he was crucified and he died and buried and resurrected on the third day to take away the sins that separate us from God. It's our sins that separate us from him. And he offers us uh, to us eternal life as a gift of his pure grace. If we will receive it, by putting our faith in Jesus and repent of our sins. That means we turn from our sins. We turn from our old way of living and we turn to him and we follow him and we, we have Jesus be the Lord of our life. We let him be the Lord of our life. John mentioned it in his epistle in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. It says this, how great is the love the Father has what? Come on, say it with conviction. Has what? 
lavished on us that we should be called, that we should be called the children of God. That is an awesome verse. How great is the love that God has lavished on us, that he has poured out on us. That people like you and me, with all of our past, with all of our weaknesses, uh, could be brought into the family of God. Wonder of wonders. And, and, And not only brought into the family of God, but hear God say to us the three most wonderful words in any language, I love you. God himself, creator of the heavens and the earth, says to you, I love you. I love you. Hear him saying that to you today. He's saying to you today, I love you. I don't think that we could hear hear it enough. Do you? I don't think we could ever hear it enough that God loves us. You see, we have a tendency coming into church on a Sunday morning to make the assumption that everybody understands that that everybody's familiar with it, that everybody knows it, that everybody feels that. You know, there's some of you this morning, and you do, in fact, take great delight and joy in the fact that there is a God who is over this universe, who is great, who is powerful, who is mighty, beyond our words to describe, who personally knows you and personally loves you. And you're feeling the warmth of that love, and it's a celebration to you every time you think about it. And then there's others, and and you might even be a believer, but those words seem a little bit distant for you, and you struggle with accepting that reality and receiving it and taking hold of that and embracing his love for you. And then there are some who, because of maybe your experience in life or because of where you've been or what you've done, maybe because you've not experienced certain things, those words seem like just a bunch of talk. And we could talk about the love of God, and maybe you're aware of it in terms of concept, but you've never really experienced the love of God personally, experientially, one-on-one. And God desires that for you, for you to know his love for you. And until you've embraced him, until you've embraced the Son of God, until you've embraced the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll never really come to know the love of God in the way that he desires you to know it. God loves you so much, and we're going to talk about that today. The title of today's message is The Love of God, The Love of God. And our main text is found in 1 John 4, 9 through 10, which you just heard read just moments ago. So let's open up in a word of prayer, and then we're going to jump right into this. Father, we thank you that you love us. Lord, I pray that your word would fall on the good soil of our hearts, that we would be open to receive your word, that it would take deep root, Lord, and that it would grow strong and tall like a big mighty tree, and it would bear much fruit. For your glory, to build your kingdom and to bless your people. Amen. Amen. Someone's excited. Right. Let's get excited. Let's get that excited. Yeah. Well, let me just talk to you today in the next few moments about the love of God. I'm going to share with you two wonders. The first one's got four sub points under it, but two wonders. Maybe the first thing to help us understand is, number one, what the love of God will do for you. What the love of God will do for you. In John chapter 14, verse 23, we learn this. That when a person experiences the love of God, with that comes a closeness to God. A closeness to God. The the, the first thing that God's love will do for you is it will draw you close to him. John chapter 14, verse 23. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. And listen, my father will love them and we will come and make our home with each of them. When you experience the love of God, suddenly God is not some distant deity. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord, when you embrace Christ, all of a sudden it's God living in you. It's, it's a closeness to God. It's a living, it's living and walking with God in a new and a wonderful, wonderful way. 
Second, when a, when a person embraces the love of God, what happens is we become possessors of his love. Romans chapter 5, 5 says, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. When we know the love of God, suddenly God puts a love in our heart and we, at that point, have an ability to love that goes beyond the human dimension. Third, we finally have true and lasting peace. How many of you want peace? Not just on the outside, but on the inside. How many of you want true and lasting? We finally have true and lasting peace. Romans 5, 1, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have what? Peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. That's why we have peace with God. In the middle of chaos, in the middle of turmoil, in the middle of unrest, no matter what's happening around us, we understand that we have a God who is big, who is powerful, who is awesome, who is good, and he is a God who loves us so much. So much more than we can imagine, so much more than we are capable of loving. He loves us. He loves us so much. And if he loves us so much, the more we know he loves us, and the more we grow in our understanding of his love, the more we're at peace. Because we just know how much he loves us, and a God who loves us that much is going to look at after everything that concerns us. Number four, fourth, when a person personally embraces the love of God, they're not afraid to die. They're not afraid of death. Not only are they at peace in this life, but they're at peace concerning the next life. And what happens, listen to this, 1 John 4, 17 through 18, as we live, as we, and as we live in God, our love grows more perfect or more complete. In other words, when you open the door of your heart to his love, through Christ Jesus, when you open your door of your heart to Christ Jesus, when you embrace him and he lives inside of you, what happens is the experience of that love, it starts at that point and then it grows, it develops, it becomes greater. And we go in the words of the apostle Paul from glory to glory to glory. There's more, there's more that God has for you. God is taking us deeper into his love and he's completing it in us. It says, our love grows more perfect, so we will not, listen to this, be afraid on the day of judgment. But we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Listen, those who have given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, who have embraced his love, don't have to be afraid on the day of judgment. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. There's coming a day where everybody will face judgment. But when you know the love of God and you've embraced Christ as your Lord and Savior, you don't have to be afraid on the day of judgment. Verse 18, such love has no fear. Perfect love expels all that kind of fear. Listen, the more you know of his love, the less you fear regarding the future in this life and the life to come. I have to tell you, I'm looking forward to heaven. How many of you are looking forward to heaven? Right? Yeah. I mean, it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be wonderful to be with God who loves us as much as our God loves us. I mean, do you think that, that he's going to let, let you get to heaven and be let down in any way? Not on your life, right? Right? Heaven's more wonderful than we can imagine. The love of God tells us that. Well, we can say, you know, that sounds amazing to experience his love. And I want to embrace his love. But secondly, how do I really know God loves me? How do I really know God loves me? me. You ever ask yourself that? How do I really know? You ready? The answer to that is first, we'll talk about a few things here, but first he comes right out and he says he loves you. 
Now, it's no small thing for one, uh, let me give you some context. It's no small thing for one person to tell another person that they love them, right? And, and, and anybody, if you have fallen in love with somebody, have experienced that. You know, first you kind of put out the feelers, right? And you say, uh, I, I like you, <laughs> all right? And hopefully, you know, they say, I like you back, right? And then it grows, you know, and then, and then at one point you say, I like you a lot, <laughs> right? You intensify that, right? And, and then it's, you know, I love spending time with you, <laughs> right? We're getting there. Ooh, nervous. I'm oh, so nervy. I'm... And then finally, you're ready for that big moment and you blurt out those words, I love you, right? And you wait. <laughs> oh, scary. Scary, hearts pumping in your way. And hopefully, they respond back with, I love you too. And when they do, it's wonderful, right? But you're not going to say those words lightly, are you? Because you know that your love could be rejected. And you also know that you're going to have to back that love up, right? Now, it's the same with God. God knows that his love could and will be rejected. That there will be people who will say, I don't love you, God. And God also knows that he's going to have to back his love up. When he says, I love you, he's going to have to back that up. But with all of that having been considered, God says to you, I love you. Amen? And he not only says, I love you, but in the scriptures, he puts it all down in black and white as if to say, read it and reread it because I love you. Right? Jeremiah 31 3. Let's look at some scriptures. Jeremiah 31 3 says this The Lord, this is Yahweh, that appeared to us in times past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. Isn't that incredible? That God loves us with an everlasting love. Well, how long is that? Right? Is it till, is it till you retire? Is it till you do something bad? That means that if ever he loves us, he loves you forever. There will never be an end for his love for you. We sang about it earlier today. And then through the Bible, God begins to describe his love and explain his love to us. And he gives us analogies by which we can understand his love. And even his analogies are sometimes hard to, to, to pull down. But like this one, Psalms 103, verse 11, he compares his love for you with, to the distance between the earth and the size of the universe, all right? So he gives us an analogy to help us understand, but even then it's like, wow, you know? And he says this, verse 11, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. He loves you. He loves you more than you and I can even begin to imagine with these brains of ours in this life. And then at the cross, at the cross, God backed his love up. Not only does God love us more than we can imagine, and not only does God give us analogies to help us understand his love for us, but then Jesus came in the flesh and proved his love for us. He demonstrated his love for us. God put his love on full display as he hung there between heaven and earth on the cross, and Christ Jesus died in our place, taking our sins upon him, taking the punishment that we deserve upon himself. He loves you that much. Now, how much does he love us? How much does he love you? The best example of that is what he did for us on the cross. I want you to see some more scripture. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. I mean, this is an amazing verse. This is one you got to put to memory. If ever there's verses you put to memory, it's Romans 5, 8 definitely would be on my list for you to be like, you should memorize this. It says this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It says, but God demonstrates. 
That means God displays. God illustrates. God shows us. God expresses his love. God explains to us. God, we could use the word, God proves, right? But God demonstrates, God proves his own love for us in this. Okay, it says, but God demonstrates. Now, what's the next word? But God demonstrates, what's the next word? His. His. Whose love? Oh, not, not your love, not my love, not our kind of love, not a human love, but God demonstrates whose love? His love. God on the cross is demonstrating his love, his own love, but God demonstrates God love in this while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loves you. God loves you. It's, it, it, everybody needs to know it and needs to grow in our understanding of the depth of his love. God loves us and he showed us his love when he died for us. God loves us. The greatest proof of God's love is not that he left heaven. It's not that he came as a baby. It's not that he preached great sermons and it's not that he worked powerful miracles. The greatest proof is that he died. It's that he died. God didn't start loving you the moment you were saved. God had his eye on you and loved you and cared about you and brought you into existence and loved you before you ever had one thought about him, right? And not only before we ever thought about him, but in the middle of our sin, in the middle of our rebellion and our wickedness and our ungodliness and doing our own thing, in the middle of that, God demonstrated his love for us by dying for us. That's how much he loved us. Sinners, okay? Sinners. Just to be clear, he demonstrated his love by dying for sinners, right? Just to be clear. You know, few people will die for someone, will take a bullet for somebody who loves them, right? I mean, I mean, you got to really be in my inner circle for I'm going to take a bullet for you, right? But God died for the person who says, you know what? I know what's right. I think I'd rather do wrong. I know that's wrong. I'm going to do it anyway. He died for sinners who our sins are willful, Deliberate, intentional, calculated, planned, pre-planned. Later today, I'm going to do this. And while sinning, we enjoyed it. I'm going to do what I want to do, and I don't want anybody telling me otherwise. Christ even died for those who don't love him back. That's how much God loves us. While we were separated from him, when we didn't know anything about God, when we didn't even want to give God the time of day, when we didn't care about anything about God, God sent his son Jesus and he died for us willingly. When we don't love him, he still loves us. Why? Because he loves us with his own love. He doesn't love us with our love. He loves us with his own love. He loves us with God love. Listen, if you're here today and you don't love God, he still loves you. That hasn't affected his love for you one bit. He loves me just as much. You could go out in the parking lot and shake your fist and flip God off and cuss him out in the parking lot right after church. He loves you just as much. That hasn't affected his love for you at all. He, he loves you so much, he died for you. He loves you with a God love, his own love, because he loves us with his own love. First John 4, 9, and here's our passage uh, uh, for today. It says, here it is, God showed, God demonstrated, God proved, God expresses, God explained, God illustrates, God showed how much he loves us by doing what? By sending his one and only son into the world. That's Jesus. 
so that we might have eternal life through him. Who's him? That's Jesus, the one he sent. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave you his only son. I mean, it's all over the Bible. He died for us. He loves us that much. Verse 10, this is real love. You know, a lot of people today are talking about love. What is love and all that, right? But this is real love. This is the real deal. This is love beyond love. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. That's how much God loves you and me. That he sent his son to take away our, our sins. He took away our sins. That's the thing that he took away, the thing that separates us from him. He sent his son as a sacrifice. God's love is proved by what he did. He died for you. I like the way the ESV puts it. Look at what it says, verse 10. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, unless I miss my guess, I'm just guessing here, but you probably haven't used that word propitiation this last week in any of your conversations. <laughs> just a guess. Could be wrong, but... Just going to assume that. Propitiation, it's an amazing word. It's probably one of the coolest words in all of the New Testament. Propitiation. I dare you to use that word 10 times this week. Right? <laughs> this is like a far out, blow your mind kind of a word. Right? It's going to take us the next five to seven minutes to explain this word. I'm going to do the best I can, all right? Propitiation. Propitiation. It's a word that takes us into the courtroom. It's a word that takes us into the courtroom. And we love courtroom drama, don't we? How many of you love uh, courtroom drama? You like, you like to watch shows and movies that have courtroom uh, setting, right? I mean, our society is obsessed with courtroom platforms. Anything from Judge Judy to Court TV and all those kind of shows. Love those shows. It's fun. And when we come to propitiation, this isn't Judge Judy. This is the Supreme Court. And it's not the Supreme Court of the United States. This is the Supreme Court of Heaven. And the court has been called to order. <laughs> I get to use that. It's so fun. Thanks for letting me borrow it. I may use it. I'm just kidding. The court has been called to order, and the judge, the court of, the, of heaven has been called to order, and the judge has come in. The charges have been read, and you and I have been found guilty. How specific are the charges? How thorough is the prosecution in building their case? Not only every sin I have ever done listed but in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, Jesus says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. Every careless word, every careless thought, every careless deed, it's all there, all my sin, all of it in front of the court, written down, and we are accountable. Every person has sinned. Every person's got a rap sheet. The book of James says in James chapter 2, verse 10, if we break the law in one point, even if we do one little sin, that's all we do our whole life. If we break the law in one point, it's as if we've broken the whole law. Why? Because one sin is enough to send somebody to eternal damnation. Because any imperfection makes heaven an impossibility for us. And we can't undo that with good works. Because God is perfect in his holiness and in his righteousness, and he cannot be in the presence of sin. The Bible is very clear. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned and all of us fall short. Romans chapter 3, verse 10, there is no one righteous, not even one. None of us are righteous. None of us can be right with God on our own or go to heaven on our own merits. 
And we can't even be right with God on our own merits. No, because no person is as righteous as God. We have sinned. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin or the payment of sin. You know, when you go to work and, and, and you, you work hard, right? And, and you get a payment for that, right? You, you're earning a wage. And at the end of the day or the work week or how, however your pay period, right? You get compensated for that. What's the wage? What's the compensation of sin? Is death. People out there working so hard, right? And in their sin life, and they're sinning, sinning. What are they, what are they, what are they, what are they getting? They're building up death. That's the way. The wages of sin is death. That's the payment. So here's the dilemma. Here's the dilemma, okay? God is holy and righteous, and he is just. And sin must be punished because he's holy and he's just, right? And we want sin punished, right? If somebody were to kill your 12-year-old daughter, you'd want justice, right? How can God be, you know, God if he's not just? So God is holy, he's just, and he's perfect in his justice. He's perfect in his holiness. And sin must be punished. But here's the dilemma, but God loves us and he wants us to be with him. And we're all guilty. So, you know, so how can you and I have any hope of salvation and surviving eternal punishment since sin separates us from God? Because we're guilty, all of us, we're guilty. Everyone is guilty, no question. God is holy and just, but God is also loving and he cares about us whom he created. So what will God do? What will God do? God will punish sin, but in his love, he has provided for us a public defender. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 tells us, but if anyone does sin, let me take a moment here so this is not misconstrued because in the Greek, it's, it's, it's in a third class conditional clause, which means that if anyone sins and they will, it's not saying if by chance somebody sins, you know, it's saying if people sin and people will sin is the idea. We have an advocate with the Father. Who is the advocate? Look at the next part of the verse. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. Here, he's the righteous one. He's the one without sin. He's the one to bring us salvation. He's the righteous one. He's our advocate. Jesus is our advocate. Only he's very unusual. In, in that, remember, we're still in the courtroom, in, in that he doesn't try to prove his client's innocence. No, instead, he admits we're guilty. I'm standing there, and he's not, oh, no, 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 he, he didn't really do it. He didn't mean to do it. He's really, no, no, my client, he's guilty. Oh, he's very guilty. Nonetheless, he has never lost a case, and he never will. I want you to picture this. The judge is at the bench. All the charges have been brought. The accuser, the devil, the accuser of the brethren, the devil, Satan, the one whom the Bible says stands before the throne and accuses us night and day. He's saying, did you see this? Did you see that? Oh, remember, remember what they did. Remember, he's accusing us. The charges have all been brought. The defense, Jesus comes to state the case and Jesus approaches the bench and he says, your honor, I know my client is guilty. But on Calvary, on the cross, I took their place. I took their place. And you'll remember, you laid on me their sins, all of it. You, you laid their sins on me, and I took all the punishment for it there. And so their sentence has already been served, and the penalty has already been paid. You see, there's a, there's a really not a good definition of the word justified going around, and I want, I want to really correct it because it goes along with this. The word justified means that we are put in right standing with God. And, 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 and we are made right with God, 
when, when, when we put our faith in Christ, he justifies us, that, that he puts us in right standing, that now we have peace with God, and, there's, and, and he's given us forgiveness of sins, and so many things fall under justified. But I guess as a memory device, people have said, you need to remember uh, the word justified as, and they, they, they spell the word justified, and they kind of break it up so it looks as though it reads just as if I have never, and they say just, justified is just as if I've never sinned. When I come to Christ, it's just as if I've never sinned. He justified me. And that is incorrect theology. Because it's not like that we didn't sin. It's that we all have sinned and we are guilty, but it's been taken care of fully. Case dismissed. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> to use this is great. <laughs> this is what propitiation means. Case dismissed. The penalty has been paid. The sentence has already been served. God is holy and just, and so he must punish sins. But God is loving beyond measure, so he bore our eternal punishment. He took our death sentence. He took our place by shedding his own blood. He took our place by bearing our sin, by bearing our shame. God laid on him our sin. He was our sacrifice. And those who put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for them when they die will not have to face eternal punishment because they've received Jesus having paid it for them already. But those who reject Jesus and what he's done for them and what he has provided for them when they die will stand before the judge in heaven's courtroom with no advocate. They're on their own. And now they have to take the punishment for their own sins eternally because they didn't accept Jesus taking it for them. Jesus took their punishment. But now they have to because they rejected God's love. They rejected God's gift. They rejected their only advocate. They rejected the advocate. Why are we talking about this this morning? We do it for one reason only, to share the gospel. What is the gospel? It's the good news that God loves us and he proved his love for us to tell people he loves you and he loves me and this is how he proved his love for us. And you have an advocate. John 3, 16, and he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's two things. If we believe in Jesus, we have everlasting life. But if we do not believe, then we perish. Don't perish. Choose your advocate, right? That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I mean, we have an opportunity to share the gospel with people in this city and touch this community with the love of God like never before. People are hungry to know what real love is. And so the message of God's love isn't supposed to just be taught here on Sunday mornings, and it's not just supposed to be preached by me. And this is to be shared by every single one of us all throughout the week, every week, right? Right? On Monday, when you're at work. Tuesday, when you're at the grocery store. Wednesday, when you're at a restaurant. Thursday, when you're taking your kids to the sporting practice. Friday, when you're hanging out with friends. Saturday, when you're working in the yard, you see your neighbor. It's about introducing people to the love of God. Asking God and praying for ways for open doors and opportunities to share the gospel with people. It's about people coming to know the love of God personally, experientially, one-on-one, -on -one, for them to be able to personally embrace the love that God has for them by putting their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation. And they can know this propitiation that God has provided for them if they will receive it. I'm asking you, don't wait another day. Don't wait another moment without having received God's free gift of grace. Don't be on your own waiting to stand before the judge without the advocate. God loves people. God cares about people. 
And God loves you personally one-on-one. And he's giving you an opportunity to embrace his love for you. He is holy. He is just. He is righteous. But he is love and he is kind. And they're not in conflict because there's a place where we can see all of those at one time. When we look at Christ on the cross, I want you to picture Jesus hanging there on the cross, right? Get that in your mind. Everybody got that in your mind? Picture Jesus on the cross. Look at it. We can see God's holiness. We can see God's righteousness. We can see God's justice as sins are being punished but we can see God's love. We see, we see his own love. We see God, God's own love for us, and we see his kindness for us. I mean, it's all right there. It's all right there. Any, any question you have about God and, and is, is answered right there at the cross of what we need to know about him in this life. It's, it's right there. God, do you love me? Look at the cross. God, are you going to be there for me? You know, are, are, can, you know, are, are you going to abandon me? Look at the cross. God, can I, can I trust you? Can I, can I put my trust in, in, in you, God? Can I trust you with my finances? Can I trust you with the decisions that I have to make? Can I trust you with my... Look at the cross. It'll answer every single one of your questions. God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for you and for me. Now, it would be impossible for me to talk about the love of God and not offer people the opportunity to open their heart to his love and to have a personal relationship with him, to embrace him, to experience to experience him one-on-one. So would everyone here bow your head and close your eyes? If, if you're already a believer, would you just begin to pray? for those who need to make a decision. And I want to give you an opportunity. I mean, we started out this message with John 14, 23, where Jesus said, my father will love them and we will come and make our home with each of them. You know what? Maybe you felt God's love in this place. Maybe you felt his love from other people. And maybe in some sense you felt his love around you, but the question is, do you feel his love in you? And has there been a day when you opened the door of your heart and said, Jesus, come into my life. I want to walk with you. And in that moment, you experienced the joy and the power and the peace and the presence and the wonder, and the awe, and the amazing nature of his love, and how much he loves you. He loves you so much. And when you've embraced his love and his salvation, you you not only grow in your experience of his love in this life, but you have an assurance concerning the next life, because Jesus, your advocate, will take care of you on the day of judgment. Listen, if you wait until you die to open your heart to the love of God, it's too late. And you will stand before the eternal court of heaven on your own. And God doesn't want that to happen to you because he loves you so much. And he himself provided you the way to be saved and to walk with him. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus says, I stand at the door of your heart and knock, and if anyone opens the door, I will come in. When you say, Jesus, come into my life, I repent of my sins, I turn from my old way of living, and I turn to you, Jesus. Jesus, you be the Lord of my life. When you say yes to Jesus, You can experience the love of God in a dimension you've never imagined. He loves you so much. It's the greatest wonder in all the world, but you have to say, Jesus, be my Lord. Jesus, be my advocate. Would you do that now with every head bowed?